My name is Nat Bonfanti. I'm an emergency physician and critical care physician from UT Southwestern in Dallas. I'm joined today by Dr. Emily Gundert, also of UT Southwestern, and Max Hochstein of Georgetown uh, University Hospital. It, sorry, the Washington MedStar Hospital, correct? And also with you. All right. <clears throat> All of us are trained in various ways and in critical care, and SAEM had been looking at different ways to present topics in ECMO and eCPR. Dr. Hochstein and Dr. Gundert submitted multiple different formats, and what SAEM decided to go with was our high concept uh, judge and jury format, which <clears throat> we're going to try for you here. I'm going to act as the judge, but the audience is also going to be enabled to act as the jury and help me to make it render a decision about whether we should adopt eCPR as a more mainstream procedure going forward. Uh, to further our high concept, we have very small handwritten signs to delineate the prosecution and defense of the concept. <clears throat> We kind of came up with this in the last 15 minutes. You're welcome. <laughs> Dr. Gunder will be acting as the prosecution for the concept Not of prosecute. eCPR, and Dr. Hochstein will be acting as the defense of eCPR. eCPR in format is the use of ECMO for patients who are in active cardiac arrest. This can be performed either as an outpatient or an inpatient uh, procedure, and we're really going to be debating more on the merits of outpatient. So, to that end, I'm going to go ahead and ask Dr. Gunder to make an introductory statement regarding her prosecution of eCPR. Thank you, Judge Bonfanti. I think that we can all agree that eCPR is super sexy, right? And the, the feasibility, the cost, the mortality, the outcomes are still probably up for debate. Whether this is the absolute next step that we should be seeing tackled in every emergency department across America, I think is non-debatable. We're not ready for that yet. I think that this is a I object. procedure <laughs> that has Overall. some potential, but that we have yet to really delineate whether the benefit on mortality exists to start making this the mainstream modality for the management of cardiac arrest. There are studies out there that have demonstrated some improvement in mortality, most recently the one out of Minneapolis. Yes, we'll talk about it. But there are plenty of studies out there, most not done in the US, some not randomized controlled trials, but eCPR and the study of cardiac arrest is very challenging, that have shown very little and no statistically significant change in mortality, and you have not addressed many of the other things that we need to talk about, such as ethics, feasibility, cost, and so I just don't think that we're mainstream ready to make this the goal of every emergency department in the U.S. Dr. Hoxstein, you're welcome to respond to this as an opening statement as well. So it's fitting that uh, eCPR discussion is occurring in a courtroom setting because the patient in front of you is quite literally facing a death sentence. Uh, and studying cardiac arrest is really hard. Uh, we have learned through the past several decades of uh, studying cardiac arrest is that if you look in a sarcophagus, you can't be shocked when you find a corpse. Uh, that is to say, you can't find, it's hard to find an adequately powered trial to uh, determine the effect size that you're really hoping for. So when you look at the available eCPR data, uh, and of course the ARREST2 trial uh, right now is the apex uh, of eCPR research, uh, the data is quite clear, uh, is that you are providing a therapy uh, that is supportive of your goal of treatment of cardiac arrest, which is good neurologic outcome. Apex? It's a small molehill, my friend. I think when we're talking about mortality, it's important to talk about the fact that most of the early studies and the studies we're talking about when we argue about the use of eCPR are all within the last 10 years. And as I said before, most of them are not RCTs. This is a challenging thing to encumber. But we're talking about to survival discharge. And in some cases, in the newer studies, they're at least addressing the, the use of a CPC score of one to two to prove that there's some neurologic outcome. But they're not talking about some of the other outcomes, including loss of limb, or the need for advanced therapies, such as an LVAD or a transplant, or whether or not these people return to work, or whether or not they have other ICU complications, and things along those lines. And I just don't think that the data, even in this one study that we're quoting that was about 44%, compares to the other studies that have shown us a difference of, say, 
you know, 16 to 22 percent, 28 to 31 percent survival. These are small numbers, and the cohort out of the arrest two trial was 30 people. Which was terminated early for clear demonstration uh, of clinical benefit. Early adaptation may not be the solution in this in this regard. I think that what a lot of eCPR trials lack is external validity. So the way that we practice in the United States is very different than cannulating uh, a patient, for example, at the Louvre in Paris. Uh, and unfortunately, the majority of eCPR literature in the United States is subject to some pretty ratchet methods. That is to say, uh, registry data, retrospective, pseudo-analysis, uh, and a lot of hand waving. So the nice thing about the arrest 2 trial is that it almost emulated uh, European care uh, in the American healthcare system, uh, which shows feasibility. I think there's some pretty big differences between the European healthcare system and our own. I mean, I think what you're hitting towards is feasibility, and I think that the reality is. We've known some things about feasibility ever since the CSER trial. We know that... The CSER trial doesn't address the patient population that we are discussing today. The CSER trial was VV ECMO alone, and what the CSER trial showed was regionalization of care is important. And everyone in this room knows that because most of emergency medicine has been regionalized. This is true for, for acute coronary syndrome, for trauma, for stroke. But I think when we're talking about a disease process that disproportionately affects a certain underserved population of our nation, regionalizing this care and spending all of our money in building eCPR centers may not be the best thing we can do. I mean, we know that, yes, the more you cannulate, the more you do eCPR, the better your outcomes are probably going to be. But the reproducibility of the study done in Minneapolis is it, its crazy. It's I mean, quite feasible. Using... Why are you so good at figuring out when you put a tube in the esophagus? Because you do it all the time. So when you get really good at something, it's because you do it a lot. Dr. Gunder, I'll allow you to respond to that. I... You are in contempt of eCPR. Overruled. Sometimes, sometimes Dr. Hochstein suffers, suffers from being a little bit short-sighted. I, I, may, I may be a few inches taller than him in this regard. But and, and that, the, and... the truth is, the truth is here is that by regionalizing the care, I think we're taking something that the entire population of the U.S. suffers from and putting all of our money into a few centers where we're going to miss the populations that suffer from this the most. And so deprive everybody of a life-saving treatment? And while I think that the feasibility of learning to cannulate and I think the ability to start a program might be there, I think we're completely skipping over some of the other things that go into the feasibility. Cost, ethics, patient selection, destination. There are tons of other things that go into this. Who cares for these patients after you so cavalierly throw a couple of cannulas into their groin? Me. Dr. Oxen, she's not providing you a menu. Can you speak to the feasibility? So when we talk about feasibility, uh, it's not just the ability to put the cannulas in the vessel. Uh, an eCPR program is admittedly a substantial undertaking. Uh, what eCPR feasibility means the ability to put somebody on VA ECMO during cardiac arrest in the emergency department, uh, and then having a relatively well-lubricated system to get them to definitive therapy. Uh, and what that means is ECMO should be serving as a bridge, not a peer. Uh, and this is bridge to PCI, to thrombectomy, to whatever the case may be. Uh, and ECMO feasibility is leveraging the pre-existing systems in the hospitals uh, that are already quite nicely regionalized. Uh, and so we've demonstrated time after I think time. Feasibility comes to more than just being able to train someone to do the cannulation. And I like the point that you brought up about the fact that when we talk about ECMO, we're talking about a pair of crutches. This is not the solution. This doesn't fix the cardiac arrest. We have to have a destination. And while that destination may be PCI, thrombectomy for a PE, what do we do when there isn't a destination? The you same know, thing you do when you find that your CPR is medically ineffective. Yes, but stop. see, nobody consents. And here's one of the biggest things like I Like they do for CPR? It is true that the majority of people do not consent for CPR. You fall down on the street, you're in cardiac arrest, some random stranger will hopefully provide you with, with cardiopulmonary support. But that's a socially accepted thing that we've been doing in this country for decades for, for the good of people. I think it's a far cry different to say, hey, you go down in the middle of the street and now I'm going to put gigantic cannula in you, regardless of whether you believe in blood transfusions, regardless of whether you believe in living on the life machine, regardless of whether or not you would be willing to have a heart transplant or an LVAD or something along those lines, and maybe misconceiving your actual etiology for arrest. And then I'm destining you to have to deal with the outcome of that. And I don't I just do not think that the removal of an eCPR or a, a ECMO circuit from a patient 
is comparable to the cessation of CPR when a patient is actively dead in front of you and the family is watching it happen versus two weeks later when you have no destination for this patient and you have to walk in and actually turn the off button and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. The Lucas has the same off button. Now. Dr. Hoxstein, Dr. Gunder brings up several substantial ethical considerations. Can you speak to that from your standpoint? I don't think that there's much of an ethical gradient here. And I see no real difference between hitting the off button on a Lucas, I have no financial disclosures, any automatic CPR device that you would like to use. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you hit off on your automatic CPR device, uh, as opposed to clamping an ECMO circuit, uh, the, they are performing the same function. They are providing flow to vital organs during cardiac arrest. Whether you choose to do that with uh, an eCPR strategy using cannulas uh, or uh, with mechanical CPR, I think is completely irrelevant. The ethics of terminating resuscitation efforts really boils down to are you doing something for somebody or are you doing something to somebody? Nobody will argue to do eCPR on a patient who's going to die regardless Esoterically of intervention. Esoterically speaking, I think we can all agree that when we've reached the point of futility, we try to stop. But I think every single person in this room has sat there and done 30 more minutes of CPR on the small child whose family is crying. I think everyone in here has struggled to remove life support from someone they spent time resuscitating. And I'm telling you, it is a very different situation. And heaven forbid the person you put those cannula in doesn't want to accept blood, or they have a very strict belief about something else, and you've just totally taken that option away from them, you've also potentially impacted them with a very big economical risk. As in opposed terms of to the, the weeks-long uh, ICU stay a that happens single. after ROSC, I mean, to say nothing of the cost that is incurred uh, for the central venous access, the operations that are required to successively chop off people's limbs and guts when they're on absurd doses of vasoactive infusions for several weeks. Loss of limb would be higher in an eCPR population. I, I think that, and we're talking about here, the cost of one run of ECMO average looked at, studied, $600,000 to $1.3 million for one person to And why don't on you tell the ladies and gentlemen what the ROI for a hospital uh, stay is for a patient on VA ECMO? But if I were going to invest that money in purchasing AEDs or, quote, Lucas devices or something else, I think that there's an argument to be had for whether we should be investing this money directly into trying to make eCPR available in every single ED in the country now without the data to support it and with a lack of available discussions regarding the ethics and the outcomes. I think you're... Uh, Dr. Suggesting. Uh, for the sake of comparing apples to apples, can you explain the ROI that you were discussing earlier? So for patients that are on VA ECMO, uh, the, pa uh, the ELSO uh, Extracorporeal uh, Life Support Organization is like this big umbrella organization uh, that is, are the record keepers uh, of ECMO. Uh, and on average, hospitals make approximately $100,000 uh, for patients uh, that are on VA ECMO. So I think that there is a huge uh, return of investment uh, for a well-run eCPR program, plus the intangibles. And the intangibles, of course, the, the intangibles uh, that I mentioned are, of course, coordination with other departments, streamlining uh, lots of different service lines. Uh, the intangible benefits of an eCPR program uh, stem far outside uh, the life-saving capability of this, of this technology. Thank you. I think that's very succinct. At this point in time, I think it would be opportune to allow you both to make a closing statement in regard to whether you support or do not support the continuation of eCPR as a growth area in emergency medicine and critical care. Dr. Gundert, I'll allow you to go first. I think when it comes to the utilization of eCPR, I, I'm not so black and white, but the reality is, is that should every person working in an emergency department in America be shifting their focus on good standard care for the management of cardiac arrest to buying cardio helps and getting TEE up and running and having an ethics committee and working on an advanced therapy program and figuring out where you're going to send these patients when you cannulate them and you have a complication like a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Should we be doing that across America in every ER now? No, I don't think the data's there. I don't think we see a mortality benefit. And I think we have a lot of things left to figure out from a systems aspect, from an ethical aspect, and from a cost aspect. Do I think that there's a potential, eh, maybe down the road, but I think at this point, making eCPR out to be the future and the absolute end-all be-all of the management of cardiac arrest, we're just not there yet. Dr. Hoxian, I think it's appropriate to respond at this point. You say future, the future is here, the future is today. So in the past 20 years of cardiac arrest research, there has been no single intervention that has improved your <coughs> TTM. Say it again. 
targeted temperature management, sir? Are you familiar? Says the red hair, really. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> Calm down. Go ahead and finish, Dr. Oxstein. There's been no intervention in cardiac arrest that improves neurological outcomes uh, when uh, examined uh, across, I don't know, the past three, four decades. ECPR offers patients uh, true return to life. The goal is not to recreate weekend at Bernie's. The goal is to recreate the patient's pre-morbid functional status, and uh, ECPR gives patients that chance. Thank you both. SAM also wanted to make sure that we give you the opportunity to ask any questions as an immense jury of peers to uh, Dr. Hoxstein and Dr. Gundert. Uh, I'll open the floor now to anybody who has additional questions that may help to clarify the situation as to whether eCPR should continue to be a procedure that's offered in the emergency department. We will not insult you. <laughs> he might. It's not a guarantee from Dr. Hoxstein. Hi, um, I, don't, I don't know who's best to answer this question, but I was curious if either of you could address how you think eCPR programs could, can start to overcome some of the disparities of who's selected for eCPR, even in communities that have multiple strong eCPR programs, like I'm at Northwestern Chicago, I still see um, patient, a lot of disparity in patient selection. So I think that, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. I think one of the biggest things we're running into is that the population of patients who suffer from significant heart disease is often the underserved socioeconomically lower group of people who tend also then to live further away from and farther removed from available access. One of the key successes that we need in order to have an outcome like what was seen in Minneapolis is a low transport time and a quick flow time. And I just don't think that we've made that available in the areas that it needs to happen. And a lot of that has to do with the expense of building an eCPR program. One person, a million dollars, one circuit, you know, where are you gonna get the circuits? What are you gonna do? Can you provide them the care afterwards if they have a complication? And until we are better able to bring that type of availability into a community that will need it and use it the most, there's gonna be disparages there. And I think that's a concern. It takes integration with the pre-hospital system. Uh, so it's no secret that certain pre-hospital systems have predilections to going to certain hospitals for whatever reason. Uh, one thing that, uh, for example, in Washington, D.C., that happens is that for all patients with refractory VF, uh, defined by uh, three, three shocks um, and still has VF, the patient goes to a designated ECMO center. Uh, and I think that uh, while that can be difficult to coordinate given a lot of stakeholders, uh, that should be the priority to regionalize uh, and not just localize to population, but truly regionalize uh, the care of patients on ECMO. And we still, we're in a country where state to state and district to district and county to county, the rules of EMS change. Most of the studies done in Europe are done in places where physicians are far more involved in their EMS and they have nationalized healthcare systems and they have different availability and that's something yet to be addressed by any study done in the US. Are there additional questions for Dr. Gunnar? Oh, I see it, hold on. Great job to both of you. I was hoping you could incorporate the inception trial and kind of let us know what you think, uh, you know, it, how it fits in for Supports against. Supports me. <laughs> ECPR, uh, which didn't show a, a yeah, mortality benefit right, in the so, Netherlands. Right, uh, so, again, it's very difficult to interpret the results of uh, the inception trial. A lot of us think that the uh, trial was uh, horrifically underpowered. Uh, and unfortunately, it got really bad press. Uh, if you look at the last two figures of the manuscript, you can see some red bars and some blue bars, uh, which are CPC outcomes at three and six months, respectively. Uh, and you start to see some very real divergence uh, of patients with good neurologic outcomes at three and six months that were exposed to extracorporeal therapy. The reason it wasn't statistically significant uh, was because of being underpowered. And for those unfamiliar, the difference was 31.5% in the invasive group survival to discharge, hospital discharge, and in the control group, 22%. So if you look at whole numbers, it, when you hear that, that sounds like a pretty big difference, especially when you consider that the mortality rates for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are single digits most of the time. So, but, but it did not reach statistical significance. Um, and 
of the two most recent trials, this one, I would believe, slightly more reproducible. But uh, I think there, and you could say that for several of the other trials, too, that there's a trend towards probably a benefit in mortality. And in the recent years, with a focus on a higher neurologic CPC recovery. scores, yeah, with a higher neurologic recovery. The thing that doesn't come out of any of these trials, at least not, it's not well fitted out, is what do these people go on to do? Do they go to LVAD? Do they go to transplant? Do they go home on Milrinone? Do they go home and go back to work? I mean, a CPC of one to two is good, but some people can't balance their checkbook after a two-week stay in the ICU. So Some of us can't do it before the that service week in the ICU. Yeah. I can't do it after my service yes. week in the ICU. Okay. I think that's all the time that we have for this session. Uh, to keep in line with the idea that we're trying, trying to pass judgment on eCPR, um, I, I would like to just open it up to hands from the crowd. Is it time to universally roll this out? That's also my feeling. I think it's probably time for us to conserve judgment, but I also feel like it's an area that deserves intense study, and I think that there's a real opportunity here for more investigation into the subject to see which population it can best serve and how to optimize multiple areas of both the ethical and uh, feasibility of the procedure. Um, do you have any other statements that you'd like to make? Uh, as a disclosure, I w would like to say both Max and I work in eCPR centers, um, and so we hope you enjoyed at least the banter, but that if anybody has other questions or discussions, we'd be happy to hang out and chit chat later. Um, we both have experience in this kind of thing and very much had to sit down and argue about who had to argue what before we gave this. They changed sides three times. <laughs> Sometimes we kept arguing for the wrong person, too. It's confusing. Well, at any rate, thank you all for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you.